Thank you very much, everybody, for joining uh, to today's, uh, if you call it, interview or fireside uh, chat or uh, simply informal conversation with one of the technology leaders in the field of uh, microelectronics. Um, it is um, Wednesday, um, October 13. Um, and this is actually our third um, um, interview. Um, I like it. Um, I think mainly because I'm I'm the I'm the guy who gets to ask questions for the first time, right? So I usually I'm usually the one to answer the questions in academia. That's our job. But I'm enjoying having this sort of um, really thoughtful um, um, conversation with with those who have um, years and years of experience in, in the field of microelectronics slash security. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce. Um, our um, uh, uh, technology leader, um, uh, uh, interviewer, I should say today, uh, Dr. Jay Lewis. Uh, I've known Jay uh, longer than he probably knew me um, when he was in DARPA. Obviously, as an academic researcher, we need to know who, who are the folks that are, that are important decision makers in the field. And uh, and work, I worked with DARPA for many, many years and, and, and uh, had the pleasure of getting to know him uh, from far. And when he uh, moved to uh, Microsoft, um, I started interacting actually a lot more with, uh, with Jay. Jay is, uh, is a technical leader with focus on identifying and uh, creating disruptive innovations for national defense. At Microsoft, uh, Dr. Lewis leads the strategic projects focused on the future of the hardware supply chain, including access, assurance, and integrity. Before I, uh, I have Jay to give his welcoming remarks, um, um, this, is a, this is a very informal forum. I, I'll, 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 I'll ask folks to either raise their hands. Um, Emma and myself um, try our best to monitor it and make sure that we give you the opportunity to unmute yourself and ask uh, Jay a question, or uh, put your question in the chat box. And uh, what I do is that as I go through some of my own questions, um, I'll uh, I'll pick them at the right time and I'll I'll make sure that I ask your question. All right. Um, so with that, uh, Jay, thank you very much for uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and join us for this uh, missed interview today. Um, uh, please start with your uh, with, with your your, uh, your opening remarks, and from there I'll start to ask some questions. Sure, uh, Mark. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I, as we were uh, talking about earlier, uh, I was able to watch the conversations you had with both Wally Rhines and Serge Leaf. Um, really enjoyed those, so it's really an honor uh, to get to uh, spend this time with you today. And I will say that I knew about you and your work probably far earlier than you realized as well. Um, part of, uh, part of you know, my job at DARPA was uh, trying to make sure we knew what was going on, particularly in uh, you know, some of the interesting developments and, and some of the more compelling things that we could um, you know, potentially, uh, that could make a real difference. And uh, your name was uh, prominent in those conversations, uh, you, know, you, you and your collaborators. So uh, mm -hmm. it was, uh, my pleasure as well to uh, get to interact with you a little bit more directly uh, later on. So um, really appreciate the time to be here today. Absolutely. Uh, I must say that our original plan was to have uh, my uh, outstanding colleague, Dr. Walid Khalil, who is the co-director of MES Center, to be uh, having this conversation with, uh, with Dr. Luis. Unfortunately, Walid has been dealing with a really nasty cold. So um, we wish them all the best, but you know, I'll take this opportunity, I must say. So uh, let's start with uh, just uh, opening up a little bit about yourself, Jay. Just tell us about what keeps you busy, at, at what keeps you busy uh, these days. And you know, when I think about security, I always ask folks that what keeps you up at night when you think about security? What scares the hell out of you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'll, I'll maybe just tell a little bit of a, a personal story because, you know, which is really how I ended up uh, at Microsoft and doing the work that I'm doing today. And it's, uh, it's exactly that question. Um, you know, most people don't know uh, me or my background uh, was, was University of Florida uh, graduate, by the way, but um, 
you know, my background was in material science and, you know, device physics and, um, you know, other uh, types of technologies. <clears throat> as I, I, I went to DARPA uh, as a program manager and I was focusing really on imaging technologies um, and was having a blast. Uh, but at one point in my DARPA career, um, became the deputy director for the Microsystems Technology Office uh, working first with uh, Bill Chappell uh, and then Mark Rosker and, you know, sort of now sort of this responsibility over, you know, more broadly across the office. And the thing that kept me up at night was really, you know, some of the semiconductor issues, uh, semiconductor supply chain issues, you know, national strategy, um, ensuring, you know, the, the future um, you know, in, in the U.S., um, both for national defense, but also just for, uh, you know, economic security and all of the, you know, sort of nightmare scenarios that uh, were floating around out there. Um, and, you know, from a DOD perspective, really one of the big barriers to sort of solving the DOD access problem is solving the security problem and making sure that, you know, the DOD can rely on commercial supply chains um, into the future and not sort of be pegged at a particular technology that just gets older and older over time. And so, you know, of all the things we were doing and, and it was just a, a wonderful environment um, and, and got to get involved in a lot of cool things, but really uh, microelectronics security and supply chain and strategy were really the things that, um, you know, I, I was just sort of invested in uh, personally. And so, you know, when the opportunity came to go to Microsoft um, and focus on some of these same issues, uh, I, I was really excited because, um, you know, DARPA is a place where you feel like you can have, you know, sort of an outsized impact and a, and a long lasting impact and sort of big, big things can happen. Um, and I really felt the same way going to Microsoft, you know, there are just a handful of places um, where, you know, big decisions get made and, and you know, difficult things uh, can be attempted. Uh, and, and Microsoft was another one of those places. So, um, yeah. You know, given your role in DARPA and then the move to a private sector, I always find this fascinating, you know, being in academia and I, and I, and I work with closely with industry. So I kind of have better understanding of what industry is, uh, but it's still, it, it's a, it's a major adjustment. Was that, was that the case for you as well to go from a, a government uh, environment to a private sector? Very much. Uh, and, and in fact, if I go, you know, back prior to my DARPA time, I, I spent my career really in a research community, research environment, um, you know, writing proposals to the government and, and things like that. So yeah. not exactly in academia, but, it, you know, sort of very much in, in that mindset. Um, so it was, uh, you know, and, and has been an interesting shift. Uh, and, and to me, that was part of what made that move attractive because, you know, I, I like a challenge. I like to learn. I like to, um, you know, be exposed to new things. And so, uh, you know, it, it has been a chance to sort of bring some special knowledge from, you know, sort of the DOD and the national security perspective and the government perspective and how things get done on that side that might impact Microsoft. Um, but yeah, being in a culture, uh, corporate culture has been a shift. The other thing that I maybe didn't think about quite as much because I, I sort of expected that, uh, to be a, a, a big change. The thing that I maybe didn't expect quite so much was having spent a career in hardware and moving to a company that deals largely with software and just the, the pace and the, you know, the mindset, um, which is just very different. And of course you see that, um, you know, those two cultures meet each other even within the company, because of course there's a lot of hardware work going on and a lot of software work going on. A lot of the cultural habits, you know, the, the, the corporate uh, sort of habits are, you know, legacies from being a predominantly software company. Um, so that's been interesting as well, uh, but it's been a great experience. Um, and yeah, I've been, uh, very impressed with the people and, you know, the, the way that decisions get made, um, you know, and the, the priorities that they really place, you know, relating directly to, to this community, um, the priority that gets placed on security, um, you know, nothing is more important than making sure that, you know, the systems are secure, that, you know, customers can rely on our 
products and, and it's taken very seriously. That's great. So let's let's continue our conversation then in that regard. So uh, as you said, Microsoft uh, traditionally it's just been a software centric, right, a company. It, and, 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 and to be able to receive some of the hardware, they had this long lasting relationship with various companies, including Intel under this thing called Wintel Alliance, right? But obviously there's a lot more activities now in Microsoft talking about Silicon, what has changed? Yeah, you know, it's been interesting to see. And of course, uh, you know, I haven't been there for the long history of it, but um, you know, I at least get to uh, interact with a lot of people who know sort of the, the longer history and, and especially uh, of, you know, some of the people, uh, Todd Holmdahl is somebody I get to work very closely with who's sort of been in, in Microsoft hardware for you yeah. know, over 20 years, which uh, there aren't very many of those people, but, um, you know, it, it's been, so it's been interesting to learn, but really what I see uh, happening and, and from my perspective, it, it, it's almost um, an inevitable shift that's been happening. Uh, and it's this shift of, um, you know, having to bridge that gap and, um, you know, uh, just taking one example, you know, which is Azure and, and the cloud, you really couldn't contemplate being just a software company, you know, that might partner with a cloud infrastructure company, you know, and, and building a cloud platform only with software. So uh, it's almost this inevitable uh, need to sort of bridge that gap. Um, but it's not just the cloud, you know, if you go back, there's, you know, Xbox and Surface and HoloLens and Microsoft actually has a, a relatively long uh, history of, you know, developing hardware, you know, but that being said, uh, we still have many of those same relationships, the, the Wintel type relationships yeah. with hardware companies, we, we buy a lot of products um, and, and work very closely uh, with those companies. Um, and, you know, and, and I would say we're not the only example, right? If you, if you think about companies that were, you know, almost exclusively software platform companies to begin with, Google's, Facebook's, you know, things like that. Uh, I mean, Amazon has bridged almost every, you know, gap I can think of, um, you know, the, and, and even Apple, right? This, which started out sort of as a hardware differentiation, but then, you know, largely sort of shifted to software differentiation. Um, I think they're just emblematic of the advantages of, of understanding the full system. Um, and, you know, I think that's just really, uh, it had to happen at Microsoft to stay modern and relevant. And, and I think some very good decisions were made um, within the company to make sure that happened. Very interesting. I think um, you touched on the fact that there are so many other companies that traditionally they're not known for silicon, but they are talking about it. They're bringing teams together and putting things together, so including Google and Apple, etc. So, wh why do you see this shift is happening? That system companies are putting more emphasis on silicon, and it seems to be a pattern. Every 10, 20 years, we get to hear system companies are trying to do something, but at some point they see the cost is just prohibitively expensive or for some other reason, they let it go and they could come back again. Uh, what do you think that is the case? Yeah, you know, I, I'm i not sure why now. Um, you know, I, I mean, I can certainly speak sort of generically about, you know, why a, a company like Amazon might build a, a, you know, processor specifically for the cloud, but, um, you know, it sort of why now, why not 10 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this may be a little bit more difficult to say other than I think um, part of it to me, the, the common thread, because we talk a lot about specialization and you know, acceleration and specialized processors. Um, the thing that is often sort of not mentioned, uh, you know, but maybe somewhat obvious, but often not mentioned is specialization requires scale and, and a scale that sometimes makes it not really seem that specialized anymore, right? So GPUs were an example of this. That was a specialized accelerator, um, you know, and now it's it's just a thing that has its own sort of uh, uh, volume. And, you know, now AI accelerators are sort of in the same class. Um, and so, you know, if you have a company like Apple uh, or a company like Amazon, um, you know, that has sufficient volume, uh, just whether it's from a data perspective or just a silicon perspective, mm -hmm. um, that can justify optimization, um, then there are real 
you know, performance advantages, cost advantages, you know, and at the end of the day, business advantages. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of these companies now have sort of crossed that threshold of having the volume necessary to build an ecosystem around some specialized processor. Yeah, that makes sense. So um, continue our discussions around Azure. And uh, so what are the new initiatives around Silicon and uh, that Microsoft is taking? And uh, uh, what do you see the role uh, Microsoft Azure is going to play uh, in the future of microelectronic design? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's a that's a, an exciting topic internally. Um, you know, I I will say that, uh, you know, following Wally Rhines and then Serge Leaf and then saying anything about EDA seems, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit questionable. Um, but I, I can uh, maybe just make a few comments, um, you know, I, without getting into sort of business specifics. Um, you know, we have as a company, we've talked about some of the things that we're doing with respect to partnerships with EDA companies, um, you know, Siemens, Cadence, Synopsys. Uh, we've talked about some of the partnerships with uh, AMD and, and collaborating with AMD and, and TSMC and others. So you can start to see this sort of ecosystem coming together. Um, and, you know, Wally and Serge mentioned it, right? This is real. It, this is happening. It's not, you know, a, a conceptual thing that maybe someday we will um, design chips in the cloud. The question is, and in my view, it's a question of just how fast this transition happens, not, not if. Um, you know, because we've talked about, for example, uh, our participation in the DoD RAMP program, um, you know, which really highlights the sort of database validation that you can get and the security that you can get uh, in a cloud-based design environment that actually can be advantageous uh, over other, um, you know, traditional uh, computer environments. So I guess the main thing I would say is that if you're not tracking this pretty closely and pretty regularly, there's a good chance that your perceptions are out of date because things really are just moving that fast. Um, the benefits to designing chips in the cloud are increasing. The penalties that you get from moving to the cloud are decreasing. Uh, and so really, um, yeah, I don't think either of those trends uh, are, are near their um, sort of ultimate uh, the, the, the ultimate place that they're going to get. Um, you know, if you think about the benefits and just the ability to have, you know, a sort of customized to you, a design flow that is sort of pre-configured and it just sort of works, um, you know, is incredibly attractive, but it's not just that, it's, it's being able to now collaborate across organizations so that you can have a consistent environment and a consistent flow mm -hmm. uh, and be able to collaborate globally and securely, um, you know, and, and, of course, you know, from a, a cloud, you know, company perspective, we hope that, you know, the giants like uh, Intel and Qualcomm and Apple are going to start designing in the cloud. But really, if you start to think about some of the more disaggregated and distributed things, that's, to me, where a lot of, you know, the, the early advantages are likely to be. If you're, um, you know, just two examples come to mind, if you're a defense company yeah. and you need to maintain this infrastructure multiple times because you have things that need to be ITAR compliant or classified or other things, that's a real penalty. Uh, and so the ability to just sort of rent the time at the, you know, in the environment you need at the time you need it becomes really attractive. And even maybe from a university perspective, maybe you're collaborating with a, a defense company or a government project and you need, um, you know, an ITAR compliant system that I know can be, uh, quite a headache to um, to build and maintain and, and just the ability to sort of rent the resources that you need, you know, which will probably relatively small compared to most of the work that you do uh, yeah. in academia. Um, you know, there are just all these benefits. Um, and, and, and I mentioned the penalties decreasing. I mean, the, the performance is getting better, um, you know, and, and cloud companies like us, I mean, they're we're working to optimize how these workloads run uh, mm -hmm. and make sure that uh, this is as, as attractive as possible. And, and there's just, the, the progress has been very impressive. Yeah. And, and do, you, do you envision that um, a cloud environment like Azure or, or AWS, um, it's not th that they could act like a marketplace, that, that, that there are these different apps given by different vendors, even some smaller companies and startups that they have these cool technologies uh, that is available but they're not necessarily part of those three big EDA companies. 
that these apps potentially have a chance to be part of this marketplace as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, these these are sort of the, um, you know, the kinds of easy button, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of configuration, uh, you know, um, assistance, so to speak. Um, I, I think people are, are certainly working on those things. Um, the thing that I probably uh, don't understand um, you know, well enough to make too many predictions is sort of, uh, you know, the, the business side of things and how these, right. uh, you know, the, the sort of entrenched interests of the various players are, are going to play out um, between now and then, right? I, I think the, the kind of vision that you're describing uh, might be in the very near future. From a technology perspective, I think it can be, um, you know, and, and so like I said, I, I think all of this is inevitable um, it's just a question of how fast we move. Very but good. yes, I, I think the the ability for this to unlock um, new innovation and and have that actually be deployable and implementable uh, yeah. by companies, I, I think is is certainly uh, something that I could see uh, happening here. Yeah, absolutely. If I just add my two cents to what you mentioned is that, you know, there is a lot of good uh, smaller companies that they have very nice products, but those products, they don't necessarily get into the uh, the marketing machine that uh, the big three have, and they don't necessarily get all the attention. But if there is a marketplace available, they probably will get a chance to be used more. And especially uh, coming from security background, there's a lot of good tools out there that could potentially be an add-on to Synopsis, Cadence, and Mentor, right? But they may not necessarily get all the attention. But that's why I do think that uh, Azure and, and, and AWS could potentially provide a great opportunity to these smaller companies to have a chance that their products also could be tested on some of the designs that go through the design, design process within those environments. So um, now you mentioned about penalties, right? But uh, you mentioned about cost, performance, throughput, all of that is, is great. You briefly touched upon security. Mm -hmm. um, and you also early in, in your in your uh, early part of the discussions in intro, you mentioned that that's what keeps you up at night. So can you elaborate more on where do you think we are with chip security today? And how do you think Azure environment or other environment could potentially actually help with improving our trust in the design cycle and potentially even down the road, the foundries and infield, et cetera? Yeah, no, I, I, I love that question. Um, and it's a topic that I, uh, I get excited about. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'll do the really quick Microsoft commercial, uh, you know, because I, I mentioned earlier how, how important security is. And I'll just point out um, in case people didn't see it that uh, we recently announced we're going to quadruple the amount of, that the company spends on security. Uh, in the coming years, uh, which is already, you know, it's a lot today. We have literally thousands of engineers focusing just on security. And so we announced uh, $20 billion over five years uh, spent uh, just on security, $150 million spent uh, on helping federal, state, local governments actually uh, make their systems more secure. So it's something that is a priority. Um, you know, if your goal is to be sort of the compute platform for society, uh, mm -hmm. which I think is the goal probably for all of the hyperscaler cloud companies, it certainly is for us. Um, it's absolutely critical to be able to make promises uh, about the security of the data. And so when I when I think about security, I sort of, and trust, I, I think about it two ways that I think are both relevant to chip design and actually chip security. One is the security that you have in us, right? So we're, we're doing things like you know, confidential computing, um, you know, so leveraging some of the trusted execution environment technology that is available from Intel and AMD and actually implementing that on the cloud. So that's generally available. You can use it today. Um, I think we were the first company to actually make that available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is, this is what makes sure that your data, you know, and your technology is protected uh, even from us, like even from the system operator. Uh, can never have access to your unencrypted data at any time. Um, and, and making sure that that's really hardware enforced, not a hypervisor or some other uh, software approach. Um, and so you know, I really think things like that, and we're investing in fully homomorphic encryption and other you know, similar kinds of approaches, 
these are going to become sort of table sticks. These are going to be sort of expected by everybody. They're relatively small today, but I think that's going to continually change. Um, and so that that's sort of the, you know, being able to trust the environment that you're in, trust that your data is safe, trust that your IP is safe. You know, we, we are a long way past, you know, people being worried, uh, you know, most people being worried about moving their data into the cloud. Uh, but we're not completely through uh, that transition yet. And there are still people who have those concerns. And so um, that's part of it. Then there's, you know, chip security, which from a Microsoft perspective, um, and, and at least my, my current view of the world, um, this is making sure that the things we buy are actually secure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that really gets into the security of the supply chain, security of the design uh, architectures and approaches and um, you know, and like I said, we, we work with lots of companies, lots of vendors. Um, we are actually much more proactive now uh, than I think in the past in terms of helping to define what security features we think are necessary to secure the, the compute environment. Um, and, you know, and as a relatively large customer, I think those are very, you know, healthy conversations. But that said, I think, you know, you asked, where are we? I, I think we're early. And I think this is a field where there is just a, a lot of work to do, to be frank. Um, and, it, you know, in my mind, I, I think most of the improvement is really needed at the bottom end, right? So there are, there's a lot of thought that goes into making sure that an Intel or an AMD processor is secure today. Um, mm -hmm. We need to make sure that you know, the memory controller is secure, the BMC is secure, the, you know, the sort of commodity chips, all of these things need to be done. And so I'll, you know, make a, a plug for Serge's ACE program, right? This is, this is sort of the concept. I know he likes to uh, use the phrase putting fluoride in the water, making sure that, um, you know, that design tools are able to implement security without having you know, dozens of security experts, hundreds of security experts in every company that makes these commodity chips. Um, so I think that's critical. Then there's sort of the, my personal obsession, which is the supply chain security. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and from a Microsoft perspective, that's sort of our, that's our place in the world, right? We wanna make sure that the things we buy uh, have the security that we need. Um, I mentioned the ramp program earlier. I, a lot of people probably know what that is, um, but you know this is a DoD program that really focuses on security during the design and the foundry silicon manufacturing process. So it, it is not a sort of full end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain security program, but it's tackling some of the more challenging parts of supply chain security. But the thing that's important to realize if you're not uh, super familiar with the program is that the entire premise of the program is to take commercially viable supply chain security techniques and, and make those something that the DOD can leverage. Mm -hmm. And so there's this premise that there are going to be commercially viable supply chain security uh, techniques. And you know somebody has to make that uh, real and make that true uh, or else really the, the program, you know, the, the premise sort of falls apart. And, you know, so we wouldn't have signed up for it as Microsoft uh, if we didn't believe in that. And, and um, you know, our, our goal is to do this really for, for us and other commercial companies in exactly the way the DoD intended in the hopes that they can also um, leverage these things. And so that's something that we're uh, invested in and taking very seriously. Um, it's not something one company can do. And so I think we have a great, team uh, in the RAMP program and uh, sort of building this, you know, this ecosystem, I guess, of, uh, you know, that, that uh, represents many different parts of the, the design and manufacturing supply chain. Um, and so that's something we're, uh, we're trying to do. Um, sorry to go on and on about this, but this is just something I, I, I care a lot about. Maybe just my last uh, comment, um, you know, I, I, there are sort of the properties that I think supply chain security and what that, you know, that system uh, needs to have. Um, and I could, of course, go on and on about this, but I'll just say, you know, there are a couple of things that I think at the end of the day, if you sort of think about 
uh, you know, and this was something I got very used to at DARPA, right? You need to, you need to picture the future and picture something that works and then work your way backwards. And if you picture a secure, a supply chain security environment that mm -hmm. is sort of holistic and easy to access so that it, it really secures everything that we need. There are a couple of properties that I think it needs. One is to be data-driven. It needs to be near zero marginal cost, right? There, there can be cost of development, cost of research, you know, cost of develop, product development. Uh, but at the end of the day, and, and you know, there will be some, there's always a, an early cost to these things and, and we can maybe employ those first on sort of highly critical systems. But at the end of the day, it needs to be like ACE. It needs to be fluoride in the water. And, and it, so it has to be fundamentally data-driven and near zero marginal cost. It needs to be open. There are unfortunately people trying to, you know, develop things that will be sort of proprietary and lock you in to a single approach. Um, there really needs to be an underlying architecture that is open and standards-based. Within that, there can be lots of opportunities for innovation and, you know, new business opportunities and new IP, but the foundational, you know, supply chain security environment needs to be open. Uh, mm -hmm. and accessible, particularly to, you know, multiple approaches. Third, it needs to be distributive, distributable, um, mm -hmm. meaning if you're picturing sort of aggregating all of this information in one place, it'll never work because people are too possessive of their data for mm -hmm. a good reason. Um, you know, it's a lot of, you know, business sensitive, IP sensitive data, and they're just not going to give it to you. So you need to have a system that can be data driven, but access that data where it lives with the access controls that are appropriate for what that information represents. And then the last is just being end to end, right? So I think focusing on pieces of the problem is important, but where we reach an inflection point is where we can really address sort of chip IP through design, through, you know, manufacturing and, and ultimate, you know, really through uh, hardware and firmware attestation and, and secure boot. That, that's, I think, when we reach the inflection point. Excellent, excellent. Um, I, I couldn't agree more with you and uh, establishing solutions that can start from uh, from uh, from a specification all the way to system and system of systems certainly should be the should be the, the goal. Yeah, so sure. um, uh, that's a topic that I could spend a lot more with you as well. But uh, you know there is a topic of the day that we can't escape. And in fact, I was just looking at it uh, earlier this morning that says Apple uh, stopped. Uh, production of uh, 10 million of their iPhone because of chip shortage. And I saw Apple is, is down already. So um, what do you think of the problem? And why is it lasting this long? And what, what got us here? Yeah, oh gosh, what a, <laughs> that is a, uh, there's a lot of depth to that question. Um, so, you know, and, and, if it can happen to Apple, it can happen to anybody, right? Um, so there are a lot of things I think happening and that's one of the things that makes it complex. Um, you know, what gets a lot of the attention or at least has over the last uh, several months has been the automotive chip shortage. Yeah. Um, the thing that, you know, is interesting and you can, you know, you can search for this and, and find the data. If you haven't seen it, it's usually, it, it's pretty fascinating to see what happens to silicon technology nodes over time. Because you usually think of, you know, a new technology sort of displaces the old technology. But that never really happens. Um, these older technologies, they peak when they're new, they may decrease somewhat, but then they sort of live forever. You yeah. Know, they're, they're the occasional, you know, weak links that were a bad idea in the first place and, and go away. But for the most part, we have this spectrum of, of technologies and what rarely happens is people investing in the older technology. There's enough capacity in the world that companies invest in new technologies and the older technology, you know, the capacity is, is sufficient uh, for what we need. Um, you know, there are exceptions to that when there are very highly subsidized, um, mm. you know, investments. We saw um, China, for example, make a very large, um, you know, commitment several years ago now um, in, in silicon technology. And it turns out most of that was in some of these legacy technologies. Um, mm -hmm. If you don't have that, then, you know, having a new fab uh, competing with older nodes just doesn't, 
it's not economically viable. And so, and so, you know, the, the whole industry is sort of in this quandary in that older technologies, the demand for older technologies is going up. Mm-hmm. And there's just no good way to solve that. And people are, you know, doing some smart things like trying to just make sure they're maxing out, you know, the capacity that they do have. But after that, you have tough decisions. And I think, um, you know, there's, there's going to be a combination of, you know, people who are probably going to make investments in older technologies, um, you know, probably around the world. Um, I think a lot of companies are going to need to start hedging their bets Mm -hmm. and invest in newer designs in updating their designs and qualifying their designs in a newer technology uh, where the capacity can, can meet their requirements. Um, so, you know, it, it'll be interesting to play out. You, you mentioned, uh, it's going to be here for a while. I think that's, you know, these things just, um, they, they don't get resolved quickly. Um, they probably do get resolved more quickly than government, uh, <laughs> actions and, uh, you know, attempts to mitigate, which, um, are, I think, uh, you know, at a longer time scale in many cases than the actual resolution to this particular chip shortage. Um, you know, and unfortunately, and, and, and they can have the problem of, you know, trying to solve the last uh, shortage and then and, and the last yeah. uh, crisis, not the next crisis. So, um, yeah, there, I, I am very supportive of some of the things that are happening uh, in uh, the capital, you know, Washington, D.C., uh, in terms of the semiconductor industry, um, but some of the discussion about sort of solving the the short term chip shortage, I think maybe are, are not such a great idea. Very good. Um, I want to remind folks on the uh, folks on the call that uh, you can raise your hand and unmute yourself, or write your questions in the chat box, and we'll make sure that we uh, we we read them and uh, go from there. So. Um, uh, focusing on the chip shortage just a little bit. In fact, in fact, I was listening to NPR this morning. Seems like we do have a big supply chain problem because of all the inflation and everything that is happening. In fact, uh, President Biden announced uh, some programs to meet with private sector to address some of the supply chain problem. But focusing on the chip shortage and supply chain problem within uh, there. Uh, there has been some activities, right? TSMC announced that they're going to have a uh, plant in uh, Arizona. And uh, Intel first started with 20 to $30 million, billion dollar initiative. Then later on, they said, we're going to go $100 billion initiative on providing uh, foundry and foundry access. Then they tried to go after uh, global. I'm, 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 still, I'm assuming it's still that's happening as we speak. And and uh, and obviously Intel trying to become a pure play foundry. You know that's a that's an interesting role to see whether Intel can handle it or not. What what do you think of all of these activities? I, I do you really think these are the result of a supply chain problem that COVID to some degree brought to our to the surface? Do you think these are all trust issues that government has been talking? Now we got to a point, or do you think this is all coming together all at the same time and? It looks like private industry and government finally are talking about the same thing. What is- <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, there are definitely, there, there's a lot, there are a lot of different things going on uh, at the same time, for sure. You know, I, I should certainly mention, these are my personal opinions, not Microsoft opinions. And that's really true for, uh, for the entire conversation today. Um, you know, I, a little bit uncomfortable talking about other companies as a Microsoft person, but as a as a uh, just a person, um, you know, certainly happy to um, share those opinions. So, um, I, personally, I think that largely there are two conversations that happen to be colliding, mm-hmm. and sometimes it can be confusing, and they certainly do overlap. They're not completely distinct. Um, but they are largely separate. And mm-hmm. one is the chip shortage, which is largely in older technologies. Mm-hmm. And then there are the many things that are happening in terms of investments and where foundries are made and you know the Chips Act funding and things like that. Um, you know, TSMC in Arizona, Intel investments, and these are largely leading edge investments. 
And the genesis of those, really, this is something that, um, you know, has been sort of near and dear to my heart for a while. Um, a couple of years ago, it was hard to convince people that there was, you know, a, a potential crisis in front of us in terms of, you know, supply chain and accessibility of silicon. Fortunately, I think uh, that's a lot easier. It's a much easier conversation to have uh, and much easier to, um, to explain what that means. Um, and so I, I am personally, I, I think it's fantastic to see some of the um, things that are happening in terms of you know, investing specifically in the US, um, just being my home, but you know, more critically just to the industry and, and to all of us, um, just diversity uh, in where things are being made. Um, you know, I, you mentioned Intel and some of the investments they're, they're making and moving uh, to sort of foundry services. I'll maybe just point out where I am maybe a little bit, uh, you know, against a lot of the conventional wisdom I hear, um, which is, you know, I, I hear a lot of skepticism uh, about this and, you know, people sort of rolling their eyes. Um, and I don't know if Intel is going to be successful at the end of the day, but I will say I am a lot more uh, optimistic than I think most people are. Uh, mm -hmm. For a lot of reasons, I think, um, you know, you, the reasons that, you know, you commonly hear people say, say, oh, Intel's tried this before, it didn't work, you know, they don't have in their DNA, they, they don't know how to be a services company, and, you know, they, and they're behind in technology and all these things, you know, and I mean, none of those things is wrong, um, you know, however, I think, A, uh, you know, a lot has changed since the last time Intel went into this business. <laughs> I think it's existential for them to succeed. And I think they realize that, it's personal opinion. Um, it seems like they realize that, or at least they are seem to be taking it seriously enough um, to, uh, you know, make, have that make a difference. Um, you know, if you, if you sort of extrapolate the amount of silicon that Intel is going to sell um, into the future, and then you extrapolate the amount of silicon that you need to continue to scale transistors and build new technologies, um, they, they really, I think, need to uh, go make this transition happen. So, uh, so I'm hopeful at least, and I think it's just good for everybody. I, I mean, I, I think it's good for our industry. Uh, I think there's room for three. Um, I think it's good for our industry for uh, TSMC to continue to have the success that they're having, for Samsung to grow, and, and for Intel to enter uh, the market. So I, I think, um, to be honest, I think there, there are just a lot of good things happening. Um, you know, this, this concern about sort of geographic localization is something that um, it's good to see starting to change. It has a long way to go to really uh, be a solution. Um, but I think, um, you know, the, I give a lot of credit to the government, the CHIPS Act, um, and, uh, you know, for, for sort of instigating uh, these conversations and, and have it uh, being taken seriously. Um, so yeah, I, I am, I am hopeful, um, yeah. that these things will, will help. Yeah. And, and, you know, as, as, as somebody who has been in this field for the past 17, 18 years, I must say that, uh, finally having serious conversation about having, uh, foundries, um, uh, onshore and Intel getting into it, um, I'm, I'm a champion for that. Yes, yes, the history exists, et cetera, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm a big champion of uh, Intel hopefully becoming successful in making this happen. And as you said, uh, uh, having three or, or four is better than having only two. So uh, um, there are a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about. I'm looking at the clock. And again, I wanna encourage folks to uh, jump in and write their questions. Um, uh, I, I will give you a heads up about those two topics. You mentioned about chip acts that I would like to talk to you about as well. Hopefully we get a chance to do that. I, mm -hmm. see, an, I see a message from uh, or question from Michael. And the second one is actually, um, is this notion of talent shortage, which I want to bring it up to you and see uh, what you think. So with that, Michael, do you want to ask your question or you want me to read it for you? I can. Uh, why don't you read it for me? Thank you. We'll do that. You do have some background noise, so I'll, let me let me do that. So please, uh, folks, put yourself on mute if you're not uh, if you're not speaking. Uh, thank you. 
So Michael is asking a question, says, beyond the large foundries, Intel, TSMC, et cetera, what role do you see smaller back end of the line suppliers playing in the industrial base in the future? Excellent question. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, the, I mean, another sort of interesting trend maybe over the last five years or so is, um, you know, what, did, what back end of line, what advanced packaging looks like in this uh, this sort of continuum from, you know, what a foundry looks like to, you know, a, a pack, advanced packaging facility looking very much like a foundry to more traditional sort of back end of line and, and traditional packaging. Um, you know, from a personal perspective, I, what I appreciate about, you know, what is the attention uh, that is being uh, placed on this today is that I think you know, the advanced node technologies, advanced node logic are sort of the hardest problems to solve. Um, they take the longest time, they take the most money. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're sort of the big ships that are, are difficult to steer. Um, for some of the back end of line things, you know, today there is more diversity in, in where that's done. Um, you know, it, it is still, you know, I think largely in, in Southeast Asia, um, but there's a bit more diversity there. And there's also just a lot more diversity in technology as well. Um, so, you know, to me, I, I think about this in terms of, um, you know, sort of doing the big hard thing first, um, you know, where back end of line uh, is done, uh, what, you know, um, who's going to make those changes and, and create incentives for moving things around. Um, I think is still an earlier, uh, sort of our earlier stages of that conversation. Um, you know, I think any hardware company today is, is looking at their supply chain uh, through a new lens, um, which does include uh, things like security and, and just also, you know, reliability and access. And so I think there will be shifts, but unlike, I think the reason we're just always talking about TSMC and Intel and, and Samsung is because it's easy to talk about these three big things and it's easier to wrap your head around. And when they make a decision, everybody knows about it. Um, and some of these other sort of back end of the line uh, companies um, are already starting to make some changes and will continue to do so. And it may not be in the news, um, but I think that you know there will be sort of gradual change there as well. It's certainly part of the, the big picture. Thank you. So uh, because time is short, um, um, let's let's quickly go to the other two questions. One is Chip Act. You briefly mentioned it. Mm -hmm. What do you think of Chip Act? Do you think that this investment would be a good start, sufficient? And what would be best use of best, uh, uh, Chip Act? Uh, uh, what, what it could accomplish in your opinion? Yeah, um, so Real briefly, and again, personal opinions. <laughs> um, I am a big supporter of the CHIPS Act. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's perfect. If I got to write it, it would be different. Mm -hmm. But I understand that politics is messy, and you know this is this is what we have in front of us. Uh, and if your choice is to take it or leave it, I'm unquestionably in the camp of uh, we should take it. Um, you know, it's it's, I mean, somewhat historic in the regard of you know our. our country actually making these investments in technology and, and um, you know, so what is important about it to me really, and, and um, you know, this is maybe a longer discussion, but I think we have a long history of saying we're going to influence the future through investing in research. Mm -hmm. And that's an easy thing for politicians to say. Um, because nobody, you know, it's, it's hard to measure, nobody's really accountable, and, um, and you sort of skip over the, the difficult conversations. Um, I am a huge believer in research. It's been sort of my, my entire career, and so I don't mean to make that sound any less important, but the thing that we haven't done in the past is pay attention to where things are made uh, mm -hmm. and, and the sort of strategic investments that we need to make. And so, so to me, the most important part of uh, that CHIPS Act is the, the funding uh, for manufacturing capacity. In a perfect world, uh, I would love to see that be 
a little bit more transparent and efficient and make it just a tax credit. I think that's actually uh, better. And, and you could easily now talk about back end of line, and, uh, other things that it may apply to. Um, but for today, I think it's a, it's a fantastic start. I do think it's going to make a, a difference. I think it actually sort of already has in some of the, the companies that may be um, anticipating that with some of the decisions they're making today. Very good. So uh, uh, Goss put together a very long question. Goss, do you want to read the question yourself or you want me to do that? Yeah, I can read it. Um, so I think it's a little By bit more. Goss is one of my former PhD students who is a security architect in Intel. Go ahead, Goss. Uh, yes, and a quick note, I'll be joining Microsoft on Monday, actually. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yes. So I, I have a question. So I'm um, actually part of my uh, work is also in confidential compute. And this is kind of like a race that we've seen across the industry where everyone's trying to get to uh, a composable confidential compute where isolation is provided between tenants, right? But the mindset is that one of the biggest customers is going to be uh, national defense contractors. So things that uh, customers that really need this isolation, really need this integrity and confidential protection. Mm -hmm. However, uh, and the reason you're the perfect person to answer this is with your national, uh, well, with your defense background, and you mentioned ITAR compliance, how do you see this confidential compute uh, going forward? Like would a customer like DOD really be willing to rent a tenant, even though it's isolated? Uh, but the tenant is on a server that is located somewhere else uh, on some other server farm. And uh, because it's rented, it's a tenant, it, it, that same system, the hardware, it could also be used by some other customer, right? Yeah. So how does DOD defense and confidential compute kind of merge in this environment? Yeah, I think uh, I love I love the question. Some good news and some bad news uh, in from my perspective. Um, the good news is I think this is a critical technology. Uh, it's critical for many things that have nothing to do with uh, the DOD, um, you know, whether it's finance or health data or, you know, just the, the many other reasons why um, you need to be able to, you know, trust and secure uh, the compute environment. And so, you know, I think um, companies like Microsoft and others um, are really uh, invested in, in seeing this through and making it happen. So I think, it's a good news from a technology perspective. I am less um, confident that the DOD will um, make those the changes that it would need to make to um, leverage this technology in the near term. Um, you know, it's uh, public information. Microsoft has built separate you know infrastructure uh, for the government at the levels that they require and meeting sort of the current compliance requirements. Um, and that, you know, today has been, um, you know, and those are, those are very large investments that need to operate for quite a while for them to, to pay off. And I, I think that will prove to have been the right thing to do because, um, you know, unfortunately from a technology perspective and a policy perspective, I, I think um, that will be what's required. It's just my guess. Um, you know, but we would certainly like to be able to make the case that, you know, our, our commercial cloud infrastructure is just as secure as, as uh, what we've built for the government. Very good. Um, uh, so uh, uh, let's talk very briefly about uh, uh, workforce development. What do you, uh, you know, Foundry moved to offshore facilities for many years. Um, a lot of folks have switched jobs and have gone to, they used to be, you know, working in, in, in semiconductor area and they went into other areas because, you know, the change that has happened. Um, so clearly I see there is a talent shortage. What do you think uh, uh, academia can do and what government needs to do to provide the investment to be able to train the, that workforce that is needed? Yeah, uh, so critical. Um, I don't think I know. I, I, I should be asking you what academia can do. Um, <laughs> I, I certainly, um, you know, don't think I have any good answers there. I have thought, though, some about, you know, what the government can do and how policy uh, can make a difference. I think there are a lot of things you could think about from a policy perspective in building the workforce that we need for the future. The problem is, and I think where you know policymakers um, are, would have the biggest challenge is who gets to decide. Um, yeah. You know what are the priorities, and you know you're going to have 
people who say, well, it's, it's renewable energy or it's, you know, so these other things like who, who's to say that, um, you know, semiconductor and advanced computation and, you know, hardware and software security are, are more important than these other things. And I actually think there is an answer to that question. Um, and historically, and I think still, uh, the answer is that it's the DOD's problem. Um, the DOD is sort of the one place in the government that can say, like, I got it, you know, you guys uh, have important jobs to do, you go do those, but this is a national security issue. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore we don't really need to go ask for your permission. Um, we can prioritize these things. And so I think, you know, talking to the right people in the DOD about some of these workforce development programs, convincing them that, you know, that these programs exist. Um, and so, uh, and, and sorry, I realize uh, time is an issue. I, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and say convincing the right people in the DOD why these, this is their problem, yeah. I think is, is uh, probably the most likely path to actually implement those good ideas that you and others probably have. <laughs> Thank you. So um, um, I, I want to give you 30 seconds. Uh, uh, any last words? Um, maybe the only thing I would just add is, um, you know, because I think it's a fascinating topic. People say, let's don't worry about manufacturing silicon. Mm -hmm. Let's worry about the next thing um, mm -hmm. and sort of seed leadership in silicon. And I would love to the chance to just mention that almost all of those other things require a foundation in silicon. I think they will for 50 years at, at least. And seeding a leadership in silicon, it means seeding the ability to manufacture and, and have leadership, whether that next thing is quantum computing or computing in photonics, computing analog, like these are all going to require um, the ability to do new and different things in silicon that are not off the shelf CMOS. And, um, you know, so I, I, just wanted to make sure you know I was linking uh, the, the the future and the R and D. Um, this is exactly why I think we should be investing in um, you know just manufacturing, which sometimes seems like you know to some people as as investing in yesterday, and I, I think it's actually not true at all. Very, very good, thank you, thank you very much, Jay, for taking part into this conversation. I very much enjoyed it. Um, I want to thank um, all the folks on the call. Um, Jay's interview is going to go on uh, YouTube, so please distribute it, listen to it again. Uh, very insightful. And uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody. And I must tell you, uh, Jay, go Gators. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> thanks again, Margaret. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.